Okay, the mass professor is on the air once more. Return with us now to those days of yesteryear. What days of yesteryear, you may ask, it doesn't matter. Yes, yes, I've got it. guys, you're making me feel lonely here. All right. <clears throat> so, picking up where we left off, um, uh, last uh, uh, Tuesday, we have this uh, uh, kind of atom uh, diagram of things necessary to uh, lead by example. I want to highlight acting ethically as an important part of the process. So, What happens when we act ethically? Well, we get into ethical dilemmas. Uh, that it, uh, can be a situation where it's hard to determine what conduct is, conduct is right and what conduct is wrong. So, for example, padding of cost and time estimates. Well, we're going to do some amount of padding at the end. There's always the temptation to pad the cost and time estimates at every work package, and we must resist that. Uh, exaggerating the payoffs of a project proposal. Don't overpromise. It's easy to get in trouble <coughs> by promising that uh, uh, that the project that you're proposing is going to do everything for everyone all the time. But later, when it doesn't, there may be some repercussions. Falsely assuring customers that everything is on track. Uh, I've always found the better way is to say, uh, we are having difficulties. This is my plan to get back on track. Being pressured to alter status reports. Well, that's kind of a uh, difficult one. You want to report truthfully what is going on. If there are problems, you need to report what is your plan 
to fix the problems. Falsifying cost accounts. Oh, this is a hard one. Mathematics is very sharp and you can get cut uh, when somebody comes along who starts saying, well, wait a minute, these numbers don't add up right. Compromising safety standards to accelerate progress. I worked for many years in theater. Theater has the, one of the worst safety records of any industry in America. And I watched people do, uh, when I couldn't stop them, uh, very unsafe actions. Let's stick to being safe. Uh, if somebody is seriously injured or killed because you lessen safety standards, how are you going to feel? Approving shoddy work. We want all our work to be at the quality level that we are, uh, uh, that we have already agreed on. Uh, not every project is going to be the Rolls Royce of its industry, but the quality aspect is one that we need to work out at the beginning of the project and only start to compromise that at all if uh, our scope of work is relaxed a bit. And we must remember the code of conduct. There are professional standards that have been set. Uh, for example, I feel governed by the National Society of Professional Engineers Code of Conduct. Uh, there are also codes of conduct in business. Your personal integrity relies on upholding these codes of conduct under every circumstance. All right. We have to be building trust as part of uh, our jobs as project managers. Trust comes from keeping promises, doing what you said you would do, uh, working with people in an honest and above board way. So our authors say it's a bit of an elusive concept. If we do what we say, if people can trust your word, that will build trust. So it's a function of your character and your competence. Know what you can do and what you cannot do so that when you make a promise, you're able to follow through. Now, sometimes you make a promise and you're unable to follow through and Keep your promise. In that case, uh, my belief is you apologize, you admit that you thought you could, uh, uh, that you thought you could uphold a certain standard of competence, but circumstances have intervened. So our character is part of our personal motives. Um, there are plenty of people that will lie straight to your face. But very soon, word of that gets around and those people aren't trusted. 
Our competence means that we have skills that are necessary to follow through on those motives, the things that we promised as, uh, uh, as, our, uh, uh, as part of our word. Uh, so Stephen Covey says the core of highly effective people is a character ethic uh, in the seven habits of highly effective people. Okay, well, I'm embarrassed to say I have not read that book. I have meant I've read many books on business and ethics, but not that one. So, what does that mean? Well, one thing is consistency. People can predict what you're going to do. They know if you say it, they can take it to the bank, metaphorically. <laughs> Openness. Be open, be transparent. Don't be hiding information or uh, uh, or things that you ha uh, know or have from others. A sense of purpose, that's something that's very valuable. That, uh, and people will notice if you're acting in the best interests of your organization and your project, or you are acting in the best interests of what you make, uh, what makes you go look good. Okay, so we have contradictions wrapped up inside our project management. Uh, one thing is that we are going to both innovate while we're maintaining stability, right? Uh, the, these are seem like an apparent contradiction, although I think of them as being complementary. We always want to look and see how we can innovate. How can we do things better? How can we change things for the better? But at the same time, we need stability. Your project team needs to understand that you will be there for them, that you will help them through whatever comes up. Seeing the big picture and getting your hands dirty. Sometimes the best way to lead is to actually get down there and help with the nitty gritty. Particularly, this goes with what I said the other day, particularly the worst jobs, the dirtiest jobs. Uh, when I have a project that is going uh, uh, not as well as I would like, I go help out the people that have the hardest, worst job to get them on track. That sends a signal to your team that you are willing to do what it takes to make your project succeed. We want to encourage individuals and stress the team. Individuals are going to be uh, encouraged in individual ways, right? Some people, if you lavish praise on them, they real, that really helps them, that really makes them uh, uh, work harder, try and be better, try and do better. Other people, that just embarrasses them. So we have to learn about the individuals on our team and how
how they can be motivated the best. But all of this has to be in the framework of teamwork and we're all doing this project and we all want it to succeed. The hands-off, hands-on idea, we have to know when to not get in there and make our hands uh, and get our hands dirty. Uh, sometimes it's hard to tell. A new project manager may just be aching to get into doing the nitty gritty of a certain part of the project because it's their area of expertise. Let your team members demonstrate their expertise. Only get in there if they are struggling and they need help and guidance. Uh, flexible but firm. We always want to be flexible in our methods but firm in our principles. Uh, if something doesn't work, uh, I have seen managers that um, take that with all the grace of a kamikaze attack and insist on following their method no matter what consequence comes up. Sometimes we have to step back and look at ourselves and say, you know what, this is not working. What can I do that will be better? What can I do that is going to work better? Well, a little package delivery for me. Boy, I feel excited. Uh, <laughs> And we have to think of our team and organizational loyalties. Sometimes it's, um, it's very tempting to uh, emphasize the team and put down the rest of the organization or another part of the organization we work with. But remember, your team members are going to have to go back when the project is over and work with the rest of the organization. And if y'all have been putting on airs during the time of your project, that may be a very, very difficult transition. All right, so what are the traits that we find in an effective project manager. Well, first of all, they're a, a systems thinker, right? They're not just thinking of one tiny bit of the project. They're thinking of not only our project, but how it fits into our organization and hopefully how it fits into our larger society and culture. Uh, when you do that, you start to pick up on things that you would not see if you just concentrate on the project, if you just concentrate on how the project fits in the organization. Personal integrity, um, people may work with you if you don't have personal integrity, but they probably won't enjoy the experience. And by personal integrity, I mean things like keeping your word, uh, like telling people the truth, by being open and transparent, by helping people whenever you can. I mean, 
we may not always be able to help people when they have problems, but we can always lend a sympathetic ear. An effective project manager is proactive. They don't wait for a disaster. They're looking at their risk matrix. They're thinking about what the risks are and how they're going to counter them all the time. Because you know what? Problems are going to come up. Risks are going to manifest. And it may be a risk that you hadn't anticipated, that nobody had anticipated. So you want to be able to think ahead of what the consequences of your actions might be, of your team's actions might be, of your organization's actions might be, and anticipate what are we going to do if so-and-so happens. Okay, uh, effective project managers have a high emotional intelligence. Some people will say this can't be taught. I am not so sure. Um, psychologists have had interesting results in teaching empathy to children uh, by, for example, having babies in, in classrooms when the children are young and having every child hold and cuddle the baby. It gives them a chance to see this is a little life you're responsible right at this moment for it and to see things from a slightly different point of view. Uh, not everybody has a high emotional intelligence. You hope for that, but if we just look at the whole mass of humanity, not everybody's going to have that. It's like everything else, there's a statistical curve. Some people have really high emotional intelligence, um, uh, and some people have very low emotional intelligence, and most of us are just marching along in the middle. Learn the clues that people give you about whether they're happy or whether they're unhappy or whether they have something to say, but they're afraid to say it. Uh, general business perspective. Um, okay, well, could you print paint with a broader brush than that? Um, we always have to be aware of the reason that our organization exists, its strategy, and how our project fits into that, right? So if we have a, uh, uh, a project team and we're developing a new product, we want to be aware that uh, one of the things about that is we want that product to be successful with consumers. We want it to be profitable to make and sell. And that, uh, uh, that it fits with our general organization strategy. Now, if we're working on a project for a nonprofit, our thoughts about that may be somewhat different. Um, we are not necessarily going to be looking at 
business except from the viewpoint of how can we do this at a low cost that will make people like our organization. Effective time management. Uh, that is kind of important. In fact, uh, the old saying, uh, if you have something that you need to get done, give it to a busy man <laughs> or woman, uh, holds true. Uh, uh, for example, there are tasks that I particularly have taken on within my uh, department because I have the training and I'm very efficient and effective at doing them. Whereas if they were passed off to somebody else, there might be a steep learning curve of how do we get this done. A skillful politician, you certainly hope that uh, uh, that our project manager can be a skillful politician. And by a skillful politician, I don't mean like the politicians that we see presently who are more or less promising everything to everybody in the hopes that they'll get elected and that the voters will have forgotten by the next time they need to be elected what they promised. By a skillful politician in this context, we mean somebody who can talk to everybody from the top management down to the people at the custodial level without talking down to them and without uh, over-promising or, uh, uh, or in some way making them angry. Um, kind of, uh, kind of a, uh, an important thing to do. Um, uh, I remember what my father used to say, and it seemed to work very well for him, and uh, I have adopted this philosophy to an extent. He said, Treat the mighty, mighty as if they are the humble, and the humble as if they are the mighty. Oh. And an optimist. Having a project manager that when the project hits a little bump in the road, they're like, oh, everybody run away, despair. It will never <laughs> succeed at this point. I have known people that acted this way, and I'm kind of like, man, what are you talking about? This is just a little bump in the road. This isn't, we didn't fall off a cliff. Uh, but some people do not handle setbacks well. Learn to be one of the people that does handle setbacks well. I have a question. On yes, uh, Ms. Miller. So the traits of the effective project manager, how come um, leadership skills or team player skills or anything like that is mentioned? I would say that leadership skills and team skills are imbued, if I may use the word imbued, into all of these. Oh. Okay. Um, well, maybe not all of them. Um, being a systems thinker, 
that makes you a very good team player in terms of the overall organization, right? You can see how your project fits in to the general scheme of things and what the purpose is for your project. And hopefully that translates into a vision that you are passing down to your team, thus showing leadership. Personal integrity is very important in leadership, uh, I believe, and in being a team player. Being proactive, definitely part of leadership from my uh, point of view. Being able to see ahead and to avoid the worst consequences because you are already planning how are we going to handle this. High emotional intelligence helps with both leadership and teamwork. Um, some people can walk right by somebody and they don't notice that they're sad or that they're happier than usual. But if you are able to, right, it means a lot if, uh, if you see that somebody is, is not feeling well, emotionally or otherwise, and and are able to say to them, hey, Joe, what's, what's going on? Oh, well, my wife and kids are sick, and, uh, and I'm kind of worried, uh, right? Just giving them a chance to, uh, to talk to somebody often is all they need to, to feel at least a little bit better. So now we'll go into leadership. Well, I would or say it falls team. into both leadership yeah. and teamwork. Okay. General business percept, uh, perspective, I would say, is more of a leadership thing. Uh, the, the team members on your project, they may not care about the overall functioning of the organization. <laughs> Particularly some of the technical people. Often they are very wrapped up in their particular field, what they do and what they do well, and they're kind of not bothered around, about the rest of the organization. Time management, that is, uh, that is definitely a, a leadership skill, and I think it's one that helps with teamwork. Being a skillful politician, um, I think helps both leadership and teamwork. If you as project manager are able to get everybody that you work with to work with you in, uh, on a deep level in a meaningful way, um, that's, that's big. I mean, everything from getting top management to back you up when, uh, uh, when maybe you need a little bit more time on part of the project or a little bit more budget to when you go to the custodial staff and you say, guys, listen, I'm very sorry. We have made such a mess. Uh, uh, could I borrow a, a, a bucket and a mop so that I can uh, uh, so that I can clean that up, right? And very often what they'll say is, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll get it. Yeah. Um, being an optimist, it's hell being under a pessimistic uh, leader at times. Because as long as everything is going along great, they may, you know, they, it may be easy to work with them, but when things start going a little bit wrong, they start having trouble thinking of how to deal with it 
and they start having trouble relating to people and uh, it is not a pleasant situation. So I think that's definitely a good leadership trait. Okay, having tap danced through that question. <laughs> uh, no, I really, I really think all of those things are, uh, are true. Uh, being a good leader uh, uh, really makes a difference in how hard people will work for you and how much loyalty they will show you. Uh, uh, one of my favorite sayings is uh, up there by Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower is one of the most undervalued leaders our country ever produced. People think, oh, he led us through the 50s. There was nothing particular going on. And I call BS on that idea. <laughs> In the 1950s, the Cold War was really hot. Racism was still a huge problem. Um, our country went through some financial uh, bumps during that time. But Eisenhower was such a good leader, he made everything look really easy. Uh, and in fact, he had started that in, when he was in the army. And he, um, when he was the commander of the European Theater of Operations, he was famous for taking people around to meet the troops uh, and then uh, uh, right and he would start saying oh yeah well this weapon does this and that and the other thing and the troops would go uh, no sir actually what it does is this <laughs> that right and he would just stand there and grin right he did not mind being corrected when he didn't really understand or know what he was talking about. Okay. So, uh, some su suggestions here for project managers. Build relationships before you need them. That's another leadership thing. As soon as I came here, I started creating relationships with everybody I could because I knew the time would come and probably not that far down the line when I would need those relationships. Some people come into an organization with kind of an arrogant assumption of, Oh, well, you know, I can do so much. I don't need to worry. Uh, uh, not like that. We sustain trust through face-to-face -face contact. Trust is like culture. It needs a history for it to be established. Right? You do one thing for one person one time, well, you know, they may feel friendly for you, but uh, towards you, but they may not trust you. Right? So we have to uh, maintain our relationships with people, talk to them, uh, uh, do silly little things uh, for them. Uh, uh, so, like, for example, this year, I want to, uh, uh, I want to make uh, Christmas cookies in copious quantities and, uh, and give them out to people. 
And it's not just because I like eating Christmas cookies. Right? But I want people here to understand their importance to me. That's a great way. Home baked goods. Um, now, of course, the difficulty may be um, because I have relationships with so many people here, how many cookies am I going to have to make? Uh, oh, well. It's a good problem to have. Um, realize what goes around comes around again. Uh, you know, if you treat someone badly, um, they're going to remember that the same way that if you treat them well. In fact, they may remember that you treated them badly better than they remember you treated them well. So that could very well backfire on you? What goes around comes around? Well, yeah. I mean, um, haven't you ever seen a situation where somebody comes in, they, they kind of treat people dismissively or they're arrogant, and, um, uh, and then uh, uh, later on they need somebody's help, and they're like, oh, well, uh, I'll, I'll get around to it when I can. Yeah. Okay, I thought this uh, presentation was a lot longer. I had kind of counted on it lasting through the whole <laughs> class period. Oh, wow. Uh, so feel free to bombard me with questions. I have a question, but not in this chapter. Well, sure. I'm happy to answer questions from any chapter. So, chapter 9, the, the last homework, number 5. No, I got that one. Never mind. I got it. Okay, well. Oh, I want to know. Well, this is... So, this... um. Simplified example on page 316. It says cost iteration trade off example. This um, slope crash cost my, um, minus normal cost over normal time minus crash time. Do we have to do that formula for to find out the crash durations? Or are they just kind of showing you? Because I noticed they came up with 25, but it, it's already 25. Oh, I sure, bring that up. Um, <laughs> well, oh no, they uh, they moved the time down to 24, and that's that's why there's uh, more cost. No. Yeah, I understand that, but if, I mean, like, the, this, um, formula or this slope. Right. We don't have to do that, per se, in any of our exercises, right? No. Okay. Um. Now, and then I have one more question. Okay. So, let's say. Well, let, let me finish uh, answering that oh, question. Oh, Okay. One of the reasons I think they do that is that this is a textbook uh, that is used a lot for engineering and technology types. So graphs and diagrams are part of how they think. 
right? Your yeah. brain has different parts in it. And one of them is the visuospatial sketch pad. And so that kind of an illustration sticks really well with engineering and technology types. Oh. Now we only had one engineer taking this course and that person dropped. <laughs> so I'm not too worried about emphasizing that part. Okay. And my next question is, so let's say on that same example, they have um, a crash time, that time is three, but then they have the crash time two and it costs 50 bucks or 70 bucks. So can you use that one time that A, I don't know, a number uh, B, see how it has crash time two? Can you use, do you have to necessarily use both of them at the same time or can you use one? You can use one at, uh, at okay. a time. Okay. Um, because look, what if reducing, um, Oh, let's look at another one. Reducing D really uh, reducing D by one is all that would be useful, uh, even though theoretically you could reduce it by seven. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, why would you reduce it more? if reducing by one is all you need. All you need. Okay. That's pretty much my question. And for chapter 10, I just had a question on... Well, let me point out one thing here. On 318, they have a, a project cost duration graph. That actually can be something very useful for us uh, because mathematically, if we can identify that inflection point, right, which they've done uh, on, on that, where they say, this is the optimum cost versus time point. And after this, cost only goes up. Uh, that could be something very useful to uh, identify. Okay, now go ahead and ask your next question. I don't understand where it says the the oh, um, the nine five or the exercise nine five the correct normal per, per project duration and total direct costs are provided. So what what are the indirect costs? Like where does that The direct cost is the normal cost. Uh, I would say that uh, very likely our uh, our indirect is the lowest uh, uh, the lowest uh, cost activity we have. In other words, it's one where I assume all the cost is indirect. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Now, I could be wrong on that. Ordinarily, 
See, one thing that's interesting about textbooks is they are their own little world. <laughs> right? Yes. When you look at a problem in a textbook, everything you need to answer that problem is contained in the textbook somewhere. Um, but is real life like that? Oh no. <laughs> right? If you're working for a company and you want to know what is the indirect cost, they should be able to tell you what they charge against indirect cost. Right? And sometimes it's Sometimes the indirect cost that they use is kind of ridiculous. Uh, for example, when we worked at the Army Depot, they figured the indirect cost was $99 a square foot. How they reckoned that is kind of mysterious to me because the government already owned the facility, straight up, Yeah. right? They had no loans against the facilities or the equipment. Uh, they did have to pay indirect social security cost, et cetera, but that is a per person charge. Yeah. Not not a per facility charge. They probably had uh, insurance, but I would bet that that is, um, that either they didn't actually have insurance, uh, which is uh, a possibility, because it's the government. If somebody gets hurt, they're going to end up paying one way or the other. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, I think the um, I, th I think that cost was exaggerated in that case. Uh, but if you work for a corporation. You work for the XYZ Corporation, oh, you betcha they know what the indirect cost is. And they may figure it on a basis of each shop or office, or they may figure it by the square foot. Um, but they're, they're going to know what that cost is. Um, if they don't, I would be very worried about the future of the business. Yeah. Okay. Now, the people that might not know might be things like nonprofit businesses, right? Yeah. Uh, very often, well, I say nonprofit businesses. I don't know, is it a business if it's nonprofit? Uh, good question. Organization. Nonprofit organizations. Uh, my father uh, worked for nonprofit organizations most of his adult life. But, uh, for example, at one point he was a professor at Parsons College. Parsons College is uh, gone now, but uh, its memory lives on. Um, and we had been there a very short time and he came home one day he said well I'm the department head I said how could you be the department head when you've only been here this short time and he said well I'm the technical guy and the technical guys know how to add up <laughs> 
Um, right? And that's one of the things you often have at a college or a nonprofit is everybody's head is in the clouds, uh, uh, right? They're worried about the mission of teaching the students or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, doing the good work that our nonprofit organization does. They're not worried about the nuts and bolts of how do we pay for all this. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, right, as a friend of mine once pointed out when he was on the board of a nonprofit organization, just because we're nonprofit doesn't mean we can't make money. <laughs> yeah. So, um, okay, so what other questions do we have? That's uh, all my questions. Okay, well, uh, no other questions. Boy, you're making this hard on me. You sure you can't come up with 20 minutes more worth? <laughs> Let me make a couple of announcements that, um, uh, we have been pretty much uh, uh, going through this book uh, uh, pretty fast and pretty well. If there's part of it you don't understand, I really need you to ask questions. Uh, uh, Ms. Miller has been very good about doing that, and I honor her for it and dread the days that she's not in class as a result. <laughs> uh, remember that there is a quiz every Thursday that's open approximately 24 hours. You need to do it on Thursday because then it's going to be closed uh, and you can't do it. And my grading system is set up that You've got to do homework and you've got to do quizzes. You can't learn this material without spending some time getting your hands dirty, if I may say so. Uh, pretty much everyone did well on the midterm, but doing well on the midterm and the final by itself is not enough. Um, so, what is our chapter 11? Managing project teams. All right, well, I'm not going to get into that until next time. All right, so, um, it's Kind of important, you know, there's two participants in the Zoom meeting, and they're both me. <laughs> What's up with that? Uh, I sure as hell hope people are watching uh, the video later. You know, when I, when I click onto it, it says zero views. When I click onto it, I watch it. So I don't know if anybody else is watching it. Oh, I'm so disappointed. <laughs> um, anyway, all right. Uh, I am going to go ahead and call it a class, even though it's a bit of a short one. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much. Please be careful this weekend. Uh, I can't afford to lose any students, yes. and I cry easily. Uh, so, you know, if you don't want people to be embarrassed by bald guys crying, a word to the wise. All right, well, thank you very much, and I will see you again on Tuesday. I am having a bit of a trouble on chapter nine homework. You couldn't have said that earlier when I could have solved the problem in class. <laughs>
No, I mean, I, I, I finally figured out how to do it. Okay. And the way I, the way that I was, I, I looked at the book, I looked at the video, and I checked out um, a couple of um, YouTube, sh they, they, I saw what they were doing, and how they did it is kind of different from the way you were doing it, but I hope it's okay, and I hope I'm doing it right. Okay, well, one thing I would say is a lot of a lot of what we're doing here they present as if these answers are absolute. You cannot come up with another answer than the one they give us. Yeah. Real life doesn't work out quite so neatly. Yeah. Uh, uh, so that's why I, that's why I ask can you when if there's if it says you can use it seven times that doesn't necessarily mean you have to use all seven you can use one by one and that's what I got that's how I started figuring everything out and I'm at the last one but I got it so all I need to do is send that in and then send in the quiz and then concentrate on chapter 10 homework. Fantastic. Well, I can't remember. Have I assigned any chapter 10 homework so far? Yeah. Oh, okay. You actually did. What a relief. <laughs> um, sometimes, because I don't want to assign homework before we've gone over the ideas in class, my homework will actually be a week behind. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. So. I forget. There's one day where I, I missed class. Well, I missed class a couple of times, and I felt like my missing class a couple of times kind of really messed me up because I was going at a good momentum, and then right. I missed class, and then I was like, oh. And I, couldn't, I didn't really get the concept. Which was my fault, and I'm catching up. Well, one of the reasons I've started using the video, aside from the fact that some people can't be there for class when it happens, the video can be reviewed over and over and over again. Yes, that's what I like about it. Because. Uh -huh. I do that. I do watch it over and over and over. But uh, if...